Why did Jesus bother to heal people of their physical ailments? Have you ever asked yourself that question before? While you're reading all the stories in the scriptures of these miracles of healings that Jesus did, and the text indicates that there's many more such instances than are recorded in detail in the Gospels. But why does he bother doing that? I hadn't really asked myself that before, at least not in earnest, but I found myself asking it this time as I was going through the text this week, our gospel reading for today. Maybe it's because of the strange nature of the sandwiching of these miracles in this text, that Jesus should be in a great big hurry to address the first, and yet something seemingly far less urgent gets dealt with as an interruption in the middle. But even, even beyond that, it seems that these miracles are just a temporary reprieve from the suffering of this life. After all, the end for everybody involved in the story is still death. It's still the same ending awaiting Jairus' daughter in our text. Yes, Jesus raised her from the dead, but it's not as if she's still walking around today. She still died later like everyone else. And so did the woman whose flow of blood was healed by Jesus. So why? What's the point of these earthly healing miracles? Now, some initial answers that might come to your mind, well, to show compassion and love. That's just how Jesus is. And this is true. Jesus does show his compassion and his love here and in other places when he heals people of their physical ailments. He even shows it in enduring the press of the crowd to help Jairus. Just a few verses before, he tried to leave the crowd behind to cross the Sea of Galilee. And this is a recurring theme in the book of Mark that there's this great crowd following Jesus around. And that he is restoring this woman who's been in a perpetual state of uncleanness, which is something that is really hard for us to understand or imagine. But essentially the best way I can think of it is during COVID, if you actually had COVID, but you had it for 12 years. Nobody would want to be around you. You're not allowed in polite society. That's what this woman was dealing with. Now, this is certainly at least partially true, but it doesn't explain it fully, nor does it really answer the question of why, because Jesus shows his compassion in many other ways, most especially on the cross. So why these healings? Another reason might be to gain a hearing. Maybe he's doing it, he's just doing it so that he can get people to listen to what he has to say. I'm sure his audience is much more amenable after he raises somebody from the dead or cleanses them from leprosy or tells a paralytic to stand up and walk and all those things happen, that certainly gives him more credibility than they thought before. But a problem with this reasoning is it actually clouds the reason that he's here in the first place, something that reoccurs in Mark often and really throughout the Gospels that People, even his own disciples, think that he's a teacher or a healer, and he's so much more. I mean, why do you think these crowds of people are following after Jesus? It's because of stuff like this. And as good as they are, there's a, there's a part earlier in Mark where this crowd of people are coming to the, the uh, home of one of the disciples' moms, and they said, everybody's waiting for you, Jesus, and he says, let's keep going. Because I need to preach the good news throughout the towns, for that's why I have come out. Or maybe it's to gather more people, to amass a following. Jesus might be doing this to gather a larger following. That is what most faith healers seem to do. That's what I think of when I think of a faith healer, somebody who's trying to draw a large following to themselves. And again, this may be partially true, because he does want people to know who he is and to follow him. That's what he says to his disciples, after all. But again, there's many times where Jesus views this large crowd as an obstacle to the sort of real mission that he's here to do. And another 
problem with this is he doesn't want them to see him as a simple healer or a bread king, right? Because after Jesus does these miracles, these temporal earthly miracles, that's what they want to do. They want to crown him king. That's not why he's here. So if it isn't any of these things, why does Jesus heal these people? Well, our gospel reading today gives us the answer to this question. The healing of the woman with the flow of blood and the healing of Jairus' daughter point to the reason why Jesus performs these miracles and all the healing miracles we see in the Gospels. To put it simply, Jesus performs these miracles to bring the recipients and those who witness them back into the gracious reign and rule of God, the new kingdom that he is bringing into existence through his life, death, and resurrection. And Jesus makes this quite clear through his speech and action that the physical healing is a foretaste of the real reason that he has come. It is not the end, but a sign that points to the end goal of his ministry and mission. Now, as as ironic as it seems, we're actually going to begin in the middle of this text. Because the main point of this text is not the resurrection of Jairus' daughter, but the seeming interruption of the woman being healed from the flowing of blood. See, after Jairus has come and pleaded with Jesus to heal his daughter, who in his own words is, quote, at the point of death, doesn't get much more urgent than that, Jesus allows stops on the journey to address someone else's need, which seems to us to be far less urgent or significant. Why? That's something that has always struck me odd about this text, and I'm sure it has for many of you. There's a woman who has a flow of blood for 12 years, and from what we know in the text, she's likely a wealthy widow because she's been able to spend a lot of money on doctors, which would not be something a lot of people could do, and she has gotten no results. In fact, it says she's suffered much at the hands of these physicians and has not gotten better, but has gotten worse. Now, I know some of you know exactly what that's like or have cared for someone who knows exactly what that's like. Now, as I mentioned before, this meant that she was perpetually unclean. Now, if you want to know what that was like, go into your Bible to Leviticus 15, and it addresses quite specifically the rules for those who are unclean by blood outside of the natural womanly cycles. It's very restricting and not a place you want to remain very long. And yet she's been there 12 years. So this is a hopeless person, a person who has tried every option available to her, and nothing has worked. And Jesus provides hope for her in a hopeless situation. Sound familiar? Just like he does for us. The text says she had heard reports about Jesus, and from this she decides, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, we're not sure where that thought comes from, to be totally honest. It seems sort of random, but it's mentioned a number of times throughout Mark, so there's a sense that for somebody with the power that Jesus has, even just physical contact with him will cause the miracle to take place. And this is significant in addressing the real purpose of Jesus' mission because being unclean is associated with touch. The shocking thing about many of Jesus' miracles is the people he touches that no one else will. Well, she sneaks up in this crowd of people who are thronging about and she touches Jesus' garment from behind. And what do you know? She's healed, just as she believed she would be. The text says, immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. None of the doctors did anything, but touching the garment of Jesus, she was immediately aware that her disease had been healed. And it seems like the story should end there. She didn't want to be taken notice of. The thing that she was worried about has been taken care of, and yet Jesus' response is even more curious. It's curious, especially given the circumstance. He stops and asks, 
who touched me. Now, it's curious for a couple reasons. One is, there's a great crowd, and the English translation here is thronging about him, but the sense of the Greek word is literally rubbing up against Jesus. So there's a lot of people touching him, which is why the disciples respond the way they do. They say, you're asking in this setting who's touching me? Look around, Jesus. Everybody is. And not only that, but isn't he addressing a situation where a little girl is at the point of death? He's in a hurry, isn't he? I'm sure he knew what was happening here with this woman. He could have just kept going. So why did he stop and ask, who touched my garments? The miracle's already been done, right? Well, the physical miracle wasn't the important part. What it means for the woman and everyone else who find hope in Jesus is the important part. And at this point, the woman herself doesn't really know what has happened to her. Jesus wants to make sure she does. He stops because the woman doesn't fully realize the extent of the miracle that has just occurred. So he calls out, who touched my garment? And the woman, the text says, knowing what had happened to her, she came before Jesus in fear and trembling and fell down before him. The second time that that posture has been made in our text today. An act of real faith and true humility. If you don't believe me, fall down before somebody else in public, even in our culture today. That's a pretty humbling gesture. And she tells him the whole truth of what has happened. Now, the text doesn't say exactly what that entails, but you can imagine. I'm sorry, Jesus, I've tried everything. I just wanted to touch you. I thought it would help. It did help, but I should have asked you, or whatever it is that she's saying. She tells him the whole thing. And then we get to the core of this whole section of Scripture, verse 34. And Jesus says this to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now the Greek word here that is translated as well is actually given a stronger sense than just physical healing. It's not actually the word that's often used to describe the physical healing of an ailment. It's a word that is often used as saved, which is a phrase that we're very familiar with Jesus saying, your faith has saved you. That's what he tells this woman. And not only that, but he begins his address to her with a very specific word, daughter. Now, what does that mean to someone who has been ostracized and cast out of the community and the society she lives in. It means a restoration into the family. Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The old is passing away, the new has come in Jesus. The unclean are being made clean forever. Now, it's at this point in the story that the daughter who is at the point of death is reported to have gone beyond that point and died. The text even says, while Jesus is still speaking to the woman, these servants come. And they ask their master the sensible question, she's dead, why trouble the teacher any further? Now, notice they called Jesus a teacher. I've had a lot of teachers. None of them can do anything about dead people. But, of course, Jesus is here to prove that he's more than that. And so, in the midst of this question, why trouble the teacher further, and set up by the details of Jesus' proclamation of not only a physical healing for this woman, but a salvation of her spiritual uncleanness, Jesus tells Jairus, don't fear, only believe. 
and they go on. Now, it's at this point in the text that I, I wonder a lot about Jairus. They don't give a lot of details about what he's thinking or what he's saying. I can only imagine myself in a scenario where I'm the father of a dying child and Jesus stops to have this conversation with a random stranger. I feel like I would be shouting and urging and saying, can't you deal with this later? Yet, Jairus, who begins the text by falling on his face before Jesus, and he's a man of authority, doesn't seem like he does that. And when Jesus here, even after his daughter has died, and the sensible thing would be, thanks for your time, Jesus, but we didn't make it. Jesus says, do not fear, only believe, and they still go. And he reaches the home, and the people are weeping and wailing, which is a way of honoring the dead. And Jesus sort of chides them and says, what are you doing? She's only sleeping, to which they respond with, mocking laughter, as we probably would. But then he sends them out and goes into the house with the mother and the father and the disciples he's brought with him. And he takes the girl's hand, again, touching something unclean, and commands her to arise. And she does. She rises even from death. These two miracles witness to the real purpose of Jesus' mission. To put quite simply, the making clean that which has been unclean. And not just physically, but spiritually, by sin. The great disease, the infection that began all the way back in the Garden of Eden, which has forever separated us from God and requires his action in the world, which is precisely what Jesus has come to do. So why does he bother to heal people of their physical ailments? Because their faith in him doesn't do just that. It heals a deeper illness, a deeper uncleanness, the sort that isn't temporary but eternal. And Jesus bridges this gap of the holiness of God to the uncleanness of man. It began in chapter 1 in Mark where he touched someone who had leprosy and healed him. And it's continuing here in chapter 5 when he touches someone unclean from blood and now the most unclean, a dead body, a corpse, the reality that God wishes to rectify the most, the death of his human creatures. You see, Jesus, in Jesus, a new kingdom is being established. And his miracles of healing are giving us a foretaste of what that kingdom is going to be like, a glimpse into the future that God is establishing in his son. It's going to be a wonderful place. It's a place where those who have no hope, like the woman who has run out of options, have hope. It's a place where those who are unclean, even in death, are made clean forever. Washed from their sin, brought from death to life. It is a kingdom where faith and hope in Jesus does far more than heal us of our physical ailments and diseases, but washes away our sin forever rescues us from death forever. So why? Why does Jesus bother himself with these healings? Or maybe to put it another way, why does he bother with my problems? Because he loves you. Because he's come to do so much more than heal broken bones or cure chronic pain. He's come to get rid of death, to wash away sin, to restore the relationship between human beings and their loving God forever. And he's doing that today and every day for you. In the name of Jesus, amen.